Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our final episode in this season of Sounds Japanese Canadian to Me Stories from the Stage. My name is Kunji Ikeda, and it has been an honor to lead these conversations through artistic thoughts,、uh, social dynamics. There's been so much to, to ponder, to speak about, and I've been so lucky to have been able to have these deep conversations with so many Japanese Canadian artists across Canada. In today's episode, we're doing something a little bit different. And with me now is the poet and playwright, Carolyn Nakagawa, who is also the Nikkei National Museum and Cultural Center pivot person on this project. And Carolyn has been helping me from day one.、Uh, so, hello, Carolyn, and welcome to Stories from the Stage. Hi, Kunji. It's great to be here. It's great to be on Stories from the Stage. You've been behind the scenes from day one, so it's great to welcome your presence and your voice as we do something a little different in today's episode. Yeah, since we've been introduced to the diverse theatrical worlds of so many Japanese Canadian artists, and of course, that started with you, Kunji, when Raymond passed the baton to you、mm -hmm. in that show that you presented to us through the medium of this podcast.、Um, You mentioned the proverb of no person steps in the same river twice because、mm -hmm. both the person and the river have changed.、Mm -hmm. So, we're curious to hear what your ideal Nikkei theater presentation would be now that you've gone through the process of having all these conversations. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I'd be delighted to lead us through、uh, a new setting for this, I mean, as you say, this new conversation. Yeah, new person, new river. <laughs> so I will welcome our audience into the Nikkei Theater that exists between your ears, in your mind, wherever you are. Take your seats, take a deep breath, and lights up on Kunji Ikeda. My name is Kunji Ikeda, and these are more of my stories from the stage. For this conversation and performance, It's going to be a bit of the theater in the round, which means all the audience will be on the outside in a big, big, wide circle, maybe 30, 40, 50 feet diameter, seated in, in, in two or three rows, all looking towards the inside. And as the performance begins, I would love to have some trap doors or maybe some people coming in on ropes, really unexpected entrances. All of a sudden, From the ground or from the sky, there's also not only people, but there's walls and like set pieces that come in and start to obscure more and more of the action. And I'd like a performance that is, I mean, hopefully really interesting happening in the middle. But due to the structural happenings, our audience misses parts of it. And so, as this conversation continues, I just I love that idea today of the feeling that we don't always get the full picture. And, and maybe it's one of those amusement park rides where the chairs even shift. And so, at times, you're in the front row, and at times, your chair shifts to the 10th row with 10 heads you got to peek in front of. And the feeling of Looking in and wanting to see more and really wanting to engage while there's all these challenges in order to enjoy a performance. So, with that slightly trickster esque kind of setting, I'd like to welcome our audience. <laughs> wow. I think that speaks so strongly to what people involved in live performance have been dealing with for the past year and are continuing to deal with. For sure. There's quite a few unique barriers and challenges that we're facing in practicing this art form that we believe in so deeply, in how it can play a part in our community and our thoughts and our well being. Yeah. There wasn't anything、um, recognizably Japanese in that setup that you just described, to me at least. Did I miss something? Au contraire.、Um, <laughs> 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 uh, 
Here's I where think, I learned something new. Yeah. <laughs> no, I suppose you're you're right. It, and there's no traditional um, garments or, you know, I didn't specify that some of the, maybe some of the obstacles could have been um, kabuki style set pieces. And maybe they are, maybe that'd be nice, but I don't think they have to be because I think the, one of the experiences I've really come to recognize through these conversations is that idea of not being fully on the inside and not being fully on the outside. And so that experience of how much do we see an experience to me has really touched at the heart of what it means to be Japanese Canadian, especially in the arts world. Wow, I think that's really beautiful. I love that idea of finding something that is part of a Japanese Canadian experience that isn't about aesthetic of Japan mm. or Japanese-ness, but is something that's, yeah, more conceptual and more intuitive, maybe, even for people who have not grown up thinking of themselves as connected to that part of their heritage. Mm-hmm. Which is, mm-hmm. you know, which is the case for many people in our community, although not everybody, including many of our guests. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. Great observation. I think you're right. And for me personally, my identity has always been this navigation of, am I Japanese enough? And am I Japanese enough to feel Japanese Canadian? So for me, that's been at the core of this cultural identity of self. And as I went through these conversations, I heard that same idea reflected in some guests. And then I kept also hearing the inverse of that experience, that whether they were born in Japan or that their family came to Canada after the Japanese Canadian internment and that whole experience, which in a weird way deeply informs what it means to be Japanese Canadian, but also plants the seed of this question of what does it mean to be Canadian and what does it mean to be Japanese Canadian? And so I think it's a super interesting combination of ideas of my, me and my family haven't gone through this hardship and then haven't been asked to divorce ourselves from our culture. So I don't know what it's like to be Japanese Canadian. And then on the opposite side, the side that I come from, my family has gone through this experience and has divorced ourselves from the traditional Japanese culture. And so I don't feel Japanese Canadian enough. And I think that's such a beautiful and complex place to be. And I think that's both one of the most difficult problems that we have facing ourselves as a community And also one of the most exciting opportunities that we are given as a community. I I don't know how much you're into comic books. And to be honest, I'm not the hugest comic book nerd. But the idea of Batman became Batman because he was afraid of bats. So he, Yeah. Oh my goodness, I did not know that. (laughs) So he leaned into what he was most afraid of to find his superpower. And so in the same way, I am most afraid of not being Japanese Canadian enough. And that fear has really given me a lot of fuel for my performance career and a lot of deep thought that has really impacted my interpersonal relationships and has grown to be quite a strength in in being able to relate and empathize with a wider group of my community. <laughs> yeah, I think I have also, as a Yonsei, as a fourth generation Japanese Canadian, struggled with the question growing up of, am I Japanese enough? So definitely recognize that experience. And also what you mentioned about, am I Japanese Canadian enough? Which I think as a young adult, I've come to realize is an entirely different question. Mm-hmm. Uh, And I think that's what a lot of my peers are struggling with, both um, people, other artists that I meet and other yonsei or gosei that I meet in my age cohort. And I think it's going to be a really interesting conversation 
to unfold in various ways, including this podcast. Um, it's part of a much broader tapestry of people figuring out what actually that question is and how it's different. For sure. Uh, I will share, I've been lucky enough that once in my life, I had the experience of being in a artistic and workshop setting only with Japanese Canadians. And so in this very specific context, we felt safe and empowered to ask ourselves, how Japanese do you feel? And then put us and our collaborators in line of how who you feel is most Japanese to least Japanese. Wait, you did that as an exercise in your yeah. workshop? Yeah. Did anybody cry? again no no we were really like this question was at the heart of our exploration so everyone was prepped enough to say you okay, know right. to think about it and then as it start, started coming up you know one person said that they had been studying the language and then we we're all like oh wow that's that's wow and then some people would say <laughs> oh I, I know how to make these traditional Japanese dishes and we're all like oh wow that's <laughs> you know that's not, okay that sounds different than what I initially popped into my head it sounds much more validating for sure and, yeah for sure yeah I mean and so it was this fun and in the spirit of like again it felt super safe and you know that we didn't ask people and it to being explain an all it. Japanese Canadian room probably made a huge difference in that exactly well. I, I will ask the disclaimer that you don't do this with your friends <laughs> yet <laughs> in any kind but <laughs> but in this context it was it was just super interesting and and what I what I pulled from it is a no one had the same outlook mm -hmm. and b we all we all put ourselves as the least Japanese <laughs> it was either the, the the least or the second least Japanese yeah yeah I can see that for sure and that was yeah. just so revealing yeah. absolutely yes. Yeah, don't try this at home, kids. Um, I think that's the <laughs> exception that proves the rule that it would be a difficult conversation. But yeah, I, that idea that the the one of the consistent things you found was that everybody saw themselves as the least or second least. Super fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I want to ask you uh, if you have any highlights that stuck out to you from the, the 12 incredible interviews you did with wonderfully intelligent and creative and thoughtful artists All right, what, are, what are some of your highlights oh good one I loved everyone's lights up it was so fascinating to to frame these conversations in different settings that really spoke a lot to who these artists were I think one of my favorite is because they were so different was the shift from Tetsuro's into Denise's hmm. and Tetsuro had this very beautiful casual generous sharing with the audience I think we shared some sake and then the next conversation I had was with uh, Denise Fujiwara who took us on this impossible dreamscape and this mystical poetic exploration and that was absolutely a highlight for me I, I mean I loved how politically rich the conversation were with so many uh, I'll say Hiro Kanagawa and Yoshie Bancroft, and Julie Tomiko Manning as well. Um, I learned a lot. Uh, I learned from Maiko Yamamoto, Benjamin Camino. Uh, I, I absolutely adored the guest appearance of Jun Fukumura's clown essence that Sumiko came at to join us on the conversation. I mean, I could go on and on. There was some real, I mean, I've harvested ideas that I hope to continually uh, plant in my community from Matt Miwa. Yeah, it's very, I'm, I'm super excited to see Burning Mum with Miyako Ochi's next project. There's so much oh, in too. here that, yeah, right? Yeah, so, I agree 100% with all of those <laughs> great highlights, Kunji. How about you? I mean, you've been behind the scenes helping me edit and, and look through every single episode. What's jumped out to you as some of the first things you'll think of when you think back to this season one of Stories from the Stage? I feel like my highlights are more are not so much specific moments as just things that I was globally noticing whenever I reviewed an episode that you sent me. It was very apparent to me from your conference, starting with your conversation with Tetsuro and going on from there, it was pretty consistent that 
the level of those conversations is so in depth. And so you really were a, had a chance to get to concepts and things that really drive each individual artist. And the reason that it struck me for Tetsuro is because I, I've known him for several years now and I've heard him talk in a variety of contexts. And he's a wonderful speaker and he's usually entertaining no matter what. But I've never heard a conversation with him like that. And I think part of it was that I was like, wow, he's not promoting any of his projects, mm. right? He's just talking about something that the, the things that interest him on a much higher level that's not about that more immediate hustle. But to have this chance to step back and not tie it to any particular piece of work, it's rare. And it's partly because of the pandemic that we're still moving through, I think. And also because of the way that you set up these interviews. Thanks so much. I, like, I, I feel so lucky to be able to dig into these uh, methodologies and pedagogies to ask these artists why they do what they do, what they're passionate about. It's so much fun and it's so easy. I've said this again and again that it's been so easy to nurture and and spark this conversation when these artists are so thoughtful and and rich and and intellectually filled with all these ideas that it's been an honor to be able to clarify and and dig through some of their passions. It's it's been such a great opportunity for me to, as you say, move past those conversations of what are you up to now? And to really dig into why, <laughs> why are you up to now? And who are you now? Mm -hmm. And everybody was so ready to have that conversation, which is not an easy one to have. So the other thing that was a highlight for me was just, <laughs> my gosh, these people are all so intelligent. <laughs> for it, sure. almost, it just hurts. It hurts my <laughs> mind sometimes just to <laughs> comprehend that. And even, you know, a lot of these people are people that I know know their work or know personally mm, on some mm -hmm. level. And every single one of them surprised me, not because mm. I didn't think that they were intelligent, but because just the full power of the vision that they're able to express in these interviews is not something that I was expecting. It was beyond what I expected. I will say I was lucky enough to take a little workshop with Tetsuro right before interviewing him on the art of interviewing. Wow. Yeah, it was such great timing. The NAJC put on this online event. And one of the things he spoke about in interviewing others is this magic circle of like, how much can it be just about us and the energy between us, rather than bring in these external factors of here's the show, tell me and send your energy out to the show, keep it in between us. I mean, that's a practice I'd encourage anyone listening right now is, is to cultivate with some of your pals is how can there be this magic circle of and it's quite intimate and it, but it's quite delightful to connect moving past the ideas of what did you get up to today which is super valid and necessary but if every now and again we're able to dig past that level into this and i loved the invitation of the magic aspect of it and I think that really spoke to the heart of a lot of us of why we are passionate about coming together in a theater, in dark spaces, in found spaces, to be able to think together and to grow together. And so that little offering, I think, was really nutritious and additive in these conversations that we can cultivate all the time. Wow. I'm so interested in this magic circle idea because you touched on two different aspects and expanded a little bit more about the idea of going beyond the everyday, what did you eat for lunch type of thing. <laughs> but the other aspect that you just skated past that I want to hear more about is uh, the idea of how much of it is between the two people talking. In this case, it's been two people versus, you know, the audience that is listening mm. to these podcasts. And how do you balance those two? So what's the priority and what are the, where does that shift? That's a great question. Um, and it brings me to another observation that I began to make. And it feels like a lot of these artists, we'd all heard about the idea. And, and the idea is that the personal is universal. 
And we had all heard about it. And through these conversations, I got to really respect the idea. And, and using the etymology of respect is spect, spectator, spectacles, to look, to see, to view. And then re, redo, rehash, rethink. So to, to view again. And through all these different perspectives of all these different artists, I really began to again and again respect and understand that the personal is universal. And so within the magic circle and to communicate honestly between us, and I'm gesturing towards my computer at this time, that translates more so than the intention to speak to someone listening in our Nikkei theater of the mind. When I am welcomed into that intimate, safer, considered space, I can feel more myself. And that is what resonates more strongly with audience members. Right. Yeah. So it's, it's almost like the, the circle itself is everything. The circle is everything. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that actually speaks to a thought that I had early on when I was listening to the first few episodes is I was wondering to myself, like, you know, I'm a theater artist. I get really nerdy about all this stuff. So, of course, I'm loving this. But I'm like, is this going to be interesting to people who who are not artists, who are interested in, in Japanese Canadian culture for other reasons and come to it from other perspectives? And, you know, I have a fairly limited sample size of people that happen to reach out or people who I chat with. But I think the answer is yes, that people have been responding well to these very high level conversations about mm -hmm. art, regardless of whether or not they are artists themselves. Yeah, I feel so, so lucky in my time here to be able to dig into some artistic ideas. And I really value and believe deeply. I mean, it goes back to the idea of artists as a mirror of society. One of my, one of my mentors spoke about artists who would go off into the forest and, and try and see the world differently in order to gain a different perspective so that the community could respect itself in another way. And so I feel so lucky that as a job, I get to think and reflect about what's going on within my community from this personal space. Because again, recognizing and, and reinforcing that idea that the personal is universal. I mean, I had this experience doing Sansei the Storyteller one time. I had you know, I've had innumerable people from innumerable walks of life wanting to come and chat with me. But this one Japanese Canadian person came to me afterwards and said that I had summed up in 50 minutes what they were trying to say in 50 years. And, and so I really believe that we are so lucky and honored. And, 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 and I want to say how grateful I am for those who come to a show or support the arts in whatever way you are you are fueling my ability to to come into a greater alignment with myself and my community and you so to have artists as a bit of a mouthpiece i think really makes a lot of sense in this context to invite these perspectives from those whose purpose within our community is to be able to artistically verbalize their experience. Absolutely. <laughs> it makes me think of your performance that was recently on the National Arts Center platform, Know the Rules, Win the Game. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I thought that was a little bit of a fake out that um, you set it up as being about this ancient Japanese character and then just popped in <laughs> some commentary about the contemporary Canadian art scene <laughs> <laughs> and the political structures around that. <laughs> I mean, I'm unabashed at saying that it's a clown show. We don't use the nose, but, but the structure of it is completely clown. 
so that the container of the traditional taiko mochi and the rise and the fall of their social their social equity uh, <laughs> really gave us a perfect trajectory that we try and stay quite truthful to despite as you say lodging all these contemporary ideas within <laughs> which you know is not forced in the least it's 100 suitable to the ideas that this figure brings up <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah it was it was such a delight it's such a delightful process and that was created with richard lee and with karen hines and it was it was such a welcomed invitation to ask ourselves how far is too far and mm -hmm. and in the original production you know it's a it's a ticketed audience so you need to buy a ticket to come in and then here's a small spoiler but we stop the show and busk a third of the way through and the show doesn't continue until we get money from the audience <laughs> <laughs> And like, as we were rehearsing it, we're like, this, oh, is it too far? Is this good? It's not going to work. This isn't going to work, you know? And I, no I should, behold. yeah, there's archival footage of people just throw, hey, raining down coins on me. And <laughs> <laughs> it was, yeah, this, such a delightful show. Absolutely. Yeah. Circling back to uh, the interviews, I hmm. wanted to ask if, there were an, any big surprises, things that you weren't expecting that came out of them? Big surprises. I think in your, when you talked to Raymond, you said something about getting, being excited to be proven wrong. <laughs> oh, that's a good one. Whoever, <laughs> whoever said that has, <laughs> has something going. Cringy <laughs> said some wild things. <laughs> Okay, well, in that context, to be proven wrong, I wasn't surprised that everyone was so eloquent. No, and nor was I, I should say. I was just mm -hmm. surprised. Like, it just exceeded my expectations, which were already <laughs> high. <laughs> I suppose I was surprised that it felt like my conversations when we turned our eye to the greater political world and it's been super interesting because within these conversations, we started in August. And so we started still in quite a, a heat of the Black Lives Matter in the wake of George Floyd's murder. And all that was super present. And the conversations have continued now into the, you know, the late winter, early spring of 2021, where the fatigue of the pandemic and the morality around following the government regulations, it's been quite an interesting political range. And so I guess what I'm getting at is I was surprised that it felt like folks were either super ready and excited to speak about it or fully didn't want to go there in our time together. Right, like an on-off switch. Almost yeah. polarizing. And I think it's it may have been how I framed some of the questions or how I framed some artists like Hiro Kanagawa has a ton of political writing in the public domain that I, I hinted at and, and some don't. And so as I reached out about, I think our conversation will touch on these aspects. But that was a surprise that either some people were chomping at the bit to really get some ideas out there or really, really prefer to, to just turn our eye to the artistic work. Right. Well, I think for me, listening to the episodes after you had done your, your first edit of them, I was surprised at how often and how thoroughly those issues came up. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, people who are artists are, are not politicians, it's not part of the job of an artist inherently to be well versed in these issues but that doesn't mean that it's not a good idea to be <laughs> to have contact with them and I think because these are all such thoughtful people they almost always did have at least something to say about them and something that was really thought-provoking and educational <laughs> in some ways mm -hmm. and, and I think that might also be part of the ripples that we're still feeling from that 
questioning of who are the arts accessible to and who do they champion, part of the ripples have been a more thorough internal investigation. So it really is mm-hmm. heartening and makes it's really encouraging that, that we've done more work as, as the months have rolled on. Right. We're overcoming the false dichotomy of that art is totally separate from politics. So it's becoming yes. maybe easier and more natural for artists to talk about these things. Although I don't think it's ever easy, especially <laughs> in, like you said, it's been such an unusual and I think a time period that it's so difficult to see mm. what it will look like mm-hmm. a few weeks or months or years from now that uh, it takes a lot to say these things on the record. Absolutely. So how are you, and maybe you don't have an answer to this question yet, but I'm wondering, this is the final episode of what we said is season one of Stories from the Stage. (laughs) You know, we we might have a season two, we don't know, or we might not. Um, But I think one thing that I'm expecting, (laughs) I'm anticipating from you, (laughs) Kenji, is that this work is going to be continuing in some form for you. Do you have any ideas about how it's going to be continuing these conversations with other artists, other Japanese Canadian artists, other Japanese Canadians? That's a great question. Um, In a way, I expected connections. I mean, not just between me and and those I interview, but I, I really hoped and believed that these offerings could really broaden our network and, and connect other people in this time. And this goes back to the idea of respect, that it's up to me to make myself available for others to respect me. So it's not only in my actions of being someone who doesn't treat people terribly, it's not only to treat people well and be excited about other people's successes, but it's also my responsibility to put myself into places to be seen, to see. I guess that's the idea of respect, is the more we can see each other and be seen, it allows us the opportunity to be respected. And so what I'm finding now is is there are young Japanese Canadian artists who have told me that they've got in touch with different people I've interviewed from the series, that they are compelled to make more connections because someone's idea really sparked something from them. I've been really honored to host events with the NAJC, with an Asian Dance Festival, with you know other young artists who want to have more conversations about their own practice. So it's hard to predict how that's going to ripple out into the world. But I've, I'm really excited to think that, I mean, it's, it's one of the stones that you and Raymond threw into the pond that are still making these ripples. <laughs> Yeah, years ago. Yeah, absolutely. I love that you're not trying to, like, let's not put a cap on, you know, (laughs) what the effects of this can be and how it can move forward and how it can be picked up by other people. Yeah, I've I've heard enough of my voice, uh, but I'd love to hear <laughs> I'd love to hear other voices still. Yeah, there's definitely no shortage of people who can have these wonderful conversations. And, Absolutely. Yeah, I love I love to hear that people have been reaching out to folks that you've been interviewing. That's wonderful. Yeah, and please continue if you're listening. Um, it really makes an artist day to you know if you find their contact info on their website to say that you listened to this i this podcast and you came away with this idea. Oh my goodness! And and if you've ever read the book How to Fill a Bucket. <laughs> And it's, it's this idea that we all carry around invisible buckets and we can only, we can't fill our own bucket, but we can fill someone else's bucket by paying them a compliment or doing something kind for them. And it's this mm. beautiful children's book. Um, oh. And if anyone out there wants to fill a bucket, please get in touch with one of these artists and tell them that one of their ideas has resonated because that we're, we're all running on pretty low buckets right now. And um that would really mean a lot. Absolutely. I agree. One other thing I appreciate is the, you interview artists at a range of different phases in their careers. Mm -hmm. And for me, that was lovely because everybody, you know, is still coming to this, this magic circle in kind of the same way. 
And for me as an artist to hear, you know, both like people that I look up to greatly as, you know, future, future goals um, <laughs> and people who I you know respect as my peers more to have them all part of this mix was really meaningful and sort of seeing, you know, the difference in being in different places in their artistic careers, but also the sameness of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was something so what's the word congealing there's something so it felt like it reinforced our community in yeah. in and a community that we might not always see yeah and you really invited that connection too by asking most if not all of the guests about advice for their younger and older selves <laughs> oh i love that question i think it's so fun oh maybe that's how we should end <laughs> <laughs> I oh, think I, did I Raymond do this? Asked you those, yeah, Raymond yeah, asked you those yeah. questions. Actually, <laughs> Raymond asked you younger self, but I don't think he asked you older self. Okay, okay, sure. Okay, do you have any advice, Kunji? Because we already did advice for your younger self in the first episode. Do you have any advice for your your elder artist self, especially after receiving wisdom from people of diverse ages and generations in this podcast? I would tell old silver-haired kunji how deeply you value play and i guess one of my fears about how i view aging is that i view less opportunities for play mm. and and i have some beautiful mentors who are in the silver years who have shown me great examples that play is still available at any point in life but i would really (laughs) i'd really advise that idea of of how is your playfulness manifesting and making space for you to be playful i think that's great advice i would love to have that advice for myself when i'm older too Thanks, Carolyn. This season has has really been inspired from your early work and your early podcasting. Is that something that you ever expected? For for there to be a new revival of the Sounds Japanese Canadian to me podcast? Yeah. I I think I've always hoped that there would be more. I stepped into co-hosting with Raymond when I started working at the museum as an intern and kind of doing all around uh you know, hands-on learning across all the museum departments. And I'm really happy that it's inspired you to take up the reins. And yeah, it would be fantastic if it inspires more people to do this or something like it in some other form. Yeah, we don't have to be prescriptive about what exactly that is, except that hopefully it's amazing. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, please send in some ideas. What do you think about, um, would it be inappropriate to call them like, that was Issei, stories from the sage is Nisei, (laughs) and then we're looking for Sansei, whatever the next (laughs) phase might be? Like, well, I don't want to make too many generalizations about the generations, but I mean, Raymond is a Sansei, I'm a Yonsei, you're you're a Sansei. I'm a Sansei, yeah. yeah. So uh, I don't know, I I think again, the the numbers thing doesn't seem to be related (laughs) to what we're doing. It's more qualitative. I think there's some poetry to that. I kind of like, you know, like, because y'all did uh, like, especially history and cultural and and like Mm -hmm. things that really stuck out. And then this is almost like finding our own feet, finding our own path Mm -hmm. through artist voices. Much more in the present, although with definitely a consciousness of history and generations through familial experience, through community experience. Sounds like Nisei, doesn't it? (laughs) <laughs> i don't think it needs numbers no, okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> with all that in mind again it's been an honor to be a part of this podcasting experience and to build community in this way thank you kuji thank you for bringing all this wonderfulness into our ears during this past year uh, it's been a great project to be able to look forward to and see how it unfolds and yeah my we'll pleasure. see how it continues to unfold. <laughs> and so to have your your uh, sight oversight and thoughtfulness and contributions have been really, really appreciated. So thank you for influencing every episode this season. 
And uh, thanks for joining me on this one. It's been a pleasure. Absolutely. And I hope to you, it has not only sounded out some new ideas and some new thoughts with you, but I also hope that it sounds Japanese Canadian to you. All right, my friends, let's take one breath together as we exit the Nikkei Theater of the Mind. And I hope these stories from the stage have found some resonance with you, your life, your journey. My name is Kunji Ikeda. It has been an honor to host our conversations through this time. I need to say a huge thank you to all the artists who have shared their ideas, thoughts, who, who trusted coming on to this podcast to share in conversation and share in community. Thank you to Raymond Nakamura, Tetsuro Shigematsu, Denise Fujiwara, Hiro Kanagawa, Maiko Yamamoto, Hiro Ide, Julie Tamiko Manning, Yoshie Bancroft, Matt Miwa, June Fukumura, Miyako Ochi, Benjamin Kamino, and Carolyn Nakagawa. What an incredible team of artists to have joined us here. Big thank you to the Nikkei National Museum and Cultural Center, as well as the Rose Foundation for the Arts and the Canada Council for the Arts, who helped make this podcast possible. The music you've enjoyed throughout these episodes was performed by Onibana Taiko. This has been my love letter to the Japanese Canadian community and the arts community, and I would feel so blessed and honored to hear from you and how you might be able to connect with your local Japanese Canadian community center or to your local arts community. I really believe that through community, we become stronger, not only together, but each individual being able to grow and share and move forward. If you'd like to build community with me, you can reach me at kunji at cloudsway.ca. That's K-U-N-J-I at cloudsway.ca. And as this beautiful host of artists take our last bow from the stage before we turn the lights off on this season, I'd like to offer how touched I am to have collected and shared in these conversations that have shown such care resilience, intelligence, thoughtfulness, perseverance. And that, my friends, sounds Japanese-Canadian to me. <laughs> <laughs>